The first few seasons of Scooby-Doo followed a predictable pattern. In each episode, a ghost or a vampire or a monster would be terrorizing a mansion or a town or a carnival, and it would seem like there's something supernatural at work. But a few Scooby snacks and a corny song later, the mask would come off and the gang would find out that there's a perfectly reasonable explanation for what once seemed mysterious. Richard Dawkins! After seeing this pattern repeated over and over again, those of us who grew up watching Scooby-Doo concluded that there's a natural explanation for everything. Then one day, the gang goes to Moonscar Island, a.k.a. Zombie Island. The odd thing about Scooby-Doo on Zombie Island is that the ghosts and zombies turn out to be real. But Fred, after so many years of unmasking fake monsters, is too skeptical to accept that he's finally dealing with real monsters. At first, Fred's doubts are entirely warranted. When Lena tells him about the ghost pirate who haunts the island, Fred says, Well, no offense, Lena, but it's probably just some guy in an old pirate suit trying to scare off the local kids. Then the ghost of Morgan Moonscar writes, Get out on the wall and levitates Velma. But Fred isn't impressed. <gasps> We've been levitated before and there's always a magnet or wire somewhere. Soon, the gang notices that they got video footage of the ghost while he was writing on the wall. Fred doesn't budge. It's probably just a hologram of some guy in a pirate suit. Fred even comes up with a motive after learning that there's a rumor of lost treasure on the island. Aha! I knew it! It's some guy disguised as a pirate ghost trying to scare everyone off the island! That's when things start to get awesome on Zombie Island. Shaggy and Scooby fall into a hole, exposing the bones of Captain Morgan Moonscar. Moonscar's ghost reunites with his skeleton, forming a zombie right in front of them. They make it back to the house and prepare for dinner, but the ghost of a soldier comes out of a mirror. Fred, however, is still convinced that it's all a hoax. It's just guys in masks. He even comes up with another possible motive. Maybe there's oil under the island. <gasps> oh my! Meanwhile, dozens of pirate zombies and soldier zombies rise up. They're coming out of the water. They're coming out of the ground. Where's Rick Grimes when we need him? Daphne's the next best thing, so she channels her inner Ronda Rousey and judo flips a zombie, temporarily stunning him. She decides to put Fred's mask theory to the test, but soon realizes that it's not a mask. Does Fred agree with her? No! Fred not only thinks it's a mask, he thinks it's obviously a mask. It's the fakest, cheesiest mask I've ever seen. Fred takes over mask removal duties for Daphne, but the zombie's head comes off instead. The zombie then reattaches his own head. How's Fred going to explain this one? It must be animatronic. Animatronics, ladies and gentlemen. But zombies continue coming out of the water and out of the ground, and Daphne wonders how far Fred's willing to go with his animatronics explanation. And I suppose they're all animatronic too! Well, it is a possibility, Daph! That's when Daphne drops an atomic truth bomb. Fred isn't really a skeptic. You're not a skeptic, Fred! You're in denial! <gasps> Ouch! So, why has Fred moved from the skeptic category to the in-denial category? Let's think about this. The term skeptic has a variety of meanings. In philosophy, it can refer to someone who denies the possibility of knowing anything or to someone who denies the possibility of certain kinds of knowledge. But in its common usage, a skeptic is a person who says, I only believe in something when there's good evidence for it. To be clear, there is a healthy kind of skepticism. There are good reasons for being careful about what you believe. If you believe anything anyone tells you, you're going to end up with a lot of false beliefs and a lot of contradictory beliefs. If you withhold belief until there's good evidence, you'll have a much more reliable and stable belief set. So the goal of a healthy skepticism is to avoid false beliefs and to get to true beliefs. But what happens when skepticism is used to avoid true beliefs and to stubbornly cling to false beliefs? Well, it's no longer any sort of meaningful skepticism. It's just denial. In Scooby-Doo on Zombie Island, 
Fred's explanations become increasingly absurd as more and more evidence comes in. If Fred were really a skeptic, he would be skeptical not only of supernatural explanations, but also of his absurd attempts to explain away the evidence. Does my mask theory really account for the evidence here? Does my hologram theory or animatronics theory really explain the data? But he isn't skeptical of his absurd explanations. He's pretty dogmatic about them. Of course, this is a cartoon and we don't believe in zombies. Why don't we believe in zombies? Because we have no evidence for them. We know where the zombie genre in films and books came from and so on. But the point is that if you did have the sort of evidence Fred has in the cartoon, that would be a good time to rethink your beliefs about zombies. And Fred ultimately does change his mind. Zombies? Real zombies? Real? Really real, Fred? I hate to admit it, but they were. Cartoons can teach us important lessons. The lesson to take from Scooby-Doo on Zombie Island is that while we tend to think that our beliefs are all based on evidence, there's clearly more at work here than just evidence because people react very differently to the same evidence. We adopt many of our beliefs long before we develop the ability to think about them critically. Even when we can respond critically, beliefs usually don't start off as hypotheses that we carefully evaluate before granting our assent. We just absorb them from the people around us, the books we read, the movies we watch. And the set of beliefs we end up with affects how we react to new ideas. If someone presents me with an idea that thoroughly contradicts some of my core beliefs, it's more difficult to take the idea seriously, whether there's good evidence for it or not, because adopting it would require such a massive change in what I already believe. For another person presented with the same idea and the same evidence, the idea will be much more believable as long as it coheres better with what the person already believes. So there's more to our beliefs than mere evidence. Our receptivity is influenced by what's already within us, both factors that we're aware of and factors we're not aware of. This is why some people look at the evidence for a hypothesis and regard it as conclusive proof, while others look at the same evidence and say that it's no evidence at all. The obvious problem here is that we can adopt a silly belief, not because there's good evidence for it, but because we like it. And we can reject good evidence because it doesn't point where we want it to point. Sykes! This brings us back to skepticism. Human beings have what we'll call a skeptometer, which controls our level of skepticism. And we can adjust our skeptometers. We can be more or less skeptical of various claims. As evidence comes in, if we don't like where the evidence points, we simply increase our level of skepticism. We can set our skeptometers so high that no amount of evidence will ever convince us of something we really don't want to believe. If an idea is attractive to us for some reason, we can lower our level of skepticism. We can set our skeptometers so low that any evidence is good enough to defend what we want to believe. Now, anyone can do this. Christians, Muslims, atheists, agnostics, conservatives, liberals. We can all adjust our levels of skepticism to preserve certain beliefs and to reject certain beliefs. This is why Fred dismisses evidence for zombies while Shaggy and Scooby react quite differently. What's interesting is that most people who call themselves skeptics are really just doing what other people do. They only direct their skepticism towards things they don't want to believe. When they don't want to believe something, they simply set their skeptometers to maximum and start explaining away the evidence. When it's time to defend their own views, they lower their level of skepticism so that any argument for their own view is entirely successful and anyone who disagrees with them must be stupid. Inconsistent skeptics do this constantly. Well, Rob's goodly. Let's look at an example. Recently, I debated Dr. Michael Shermer on the topic, Does God Exist? I like to go after people's strengths rather than their weaknesses. Dr. Shermer's PhD is in the history of science, mine's in philosophy. So in my opening statement, I based my entire argument on the history of science. That's his turf. He didn't give much of a response to my argument, but some interesting points about methodology came to the surface anyway. Dr. Shermer defended what he calls 
Shermer's last law. Shermer's last law is the claim that uh, any sufficiently advanced extraterrestrial intelligence is indistinguishable from God. If aliens had technology far more advanced than our own, they could do things that would look like miracles to us. They might be able to cure diseases instantly or regenerate limbs or change the weather. These kinds of things would seem miraculous to human beings. So from our perspective, aliens who could do these kinds of things would be indistinguishable from God. Interestingly, Dr. Shermer raises the obvious follow-up question. If we saw something miraculous, how would we know that it's God and not aliens? So my question is, is how would you know if you encountered God? That it wasn't just some super advanced ET capable of doing these amazing things. But then he asks why God doesn't heal amputees. Why is it God only seems to heal things that happen, might have happened anyway, but humans never grow limbs, never. And here I detect a problem with his methodology. If he did exist, for you atheists, would you want to know it? Some of you might say yes, some of you might say no, but if you did want to know that God exists, uh, wouldn't you need some sort of method to figure out if he exists? Some, something that could lead you to the truth about that? According to Dr. Shermer, there can be no such method, because anything God could possibly do, you could say, aliens did it, powerful aliens that are vastly beyond us. So it's built into the methodology that you could never know whether God exists or not. And if it's built into your methodology to never know the truth about something, I have to question the methodology. Dr. Shermer doesn't deal with the issue, so I ask him directly in the crossfire, what would count as evidence for God's existence? What, according to your worldview, which includes Shermer's last law, what could God possibly do to show that he exists? And if there's nothing, there's nothing that he can do to show that he exists, is this method really designed to get to the truth of the matter? At first, he jokes around. A large cash deposit <laughs> in my name in a Swiss bank. How about a box of Scooby snacks? I think 10 million would do it. But then he gives his real answer. But I'm after there is something that wouldn't happen otherwise, uh, I suppose. Something that wouldn't happen otherwise? I proceed to point out the obvious. Over and over again in this debate, it's been, um, hey, if God exists, then, you know, where's the evidence and how, why can't we find the evidence and uh, hey, we, we, should, we should be skeptical and, and demand evidence and so on. But when we ask, what evidence could God possibly give in any possible world that would count as evidence for the existence of God? The answer is something that, would ha that wouldn't happen otherwise. But something that wouldn't happen otherwise, according to Shermer's last law, could be explained by aliens. So once again, we're left with a methodology that can't possibly investigate this matter. You can watch the full debate at your leisure, but we just don't get a solution to this problem. Dr. Shermer wants evidence of God's existence, but given his methodology, nothing God could ever do would count as evidence that he exists. God could heal every amputee in the world, but it wouldn't be evidence for God's existence because aliens could have done it. Jinkies! <laughs> now, when a person says, prove to me that statement X is true, but an examination of his methodology shows that he won't allow anything to count as evidence that statement X is true, how can we take that demand for proof seriously? This is why when atheists send me messages saying, prove to me that God exists, I almost never give them an argument for God's existence. Instead, I reply, I'd be happy to prove to you that God exists, but I don't want to send proof to someone who doesn't exist, so before I prove to you that God exists, Prove to me that you exist. Then I dial my skeptometer up to 10, just like the atheist was about to do when he demanded proof for God's existence. So I get another message from the atheist saying, I obviously exist since I'm sending you these messages, but I'm a skeptic. So I ask, well, how do I know that someone's pet monkey isn't just slapping a keyboard? If something as sophisticated as DNA can form by chance, surely a monkey could type your messages by chance, especially with all of the misspelled words. 
Or maybe someone created an atheist message generator, which mindlessly sends out these messages and is even programmed with responses, all to waste the time of Christians. So we go back and forth and eventually the atheist says, look, I'll buy a plane ticket and come see you. To which I reply, how would that be any evidence at all? Even if you came to see me, how would I know that I'm not dreaming? How would I know that I'm not in the matrix? How would I know that I'm not a brain in a vat that's being controlled by some mad scientist? How would I know that powerful aliens aren't just tricking me into believing that you came to see me? And so we never actually get to a discussion of the evidence for God's existence because when I use the atheist's methodology against him, he can't even prove his own existence. This just gets better and better. The point here is that we can always explain away evidence. In the first century, thousands of people saw Jesus perform miracles, and the leaders had him crucified. How could they explain away all those miracles? Easy. They said that Jesus performed miracles by the power of demons, and that would explain the miracles, wouldn't it? If Jesus were walking among us today, people would explain away his miracles by appealing to illusion or to deception or, if all else fails, to powerful aliens. But the atheists who are watching are saying, no, if God performed a miracle, we'd believe in him. If God healed an amputee, we'd convert right now. Seriously? You have no problem with an entire universe exploding out of nowhere, but an arm growing would make you a believer? You don't think it's at all strange that non-living matter rearranged itself to form life, but if a living arm grew out of a living body, you'd never dream of ignoring or explaining away the evidence? My atheist friends, by constantly demanding evidence while proving over and over again that evidence is completely meaningless to you and that your methodology is designed to help you avoid conclusions that you don't like, you're not showing us that there's no evidence for God's existence. All you're showing us is that you're in denial. <gasps> and you might have gotten away with it, too, if it wasn't for us meddling Christians. I've been getting away with it for 200 years. <laughs> Richard Dawkins!